Hello! Hello! Let's try it one more time. Hello! Hello! All right, now we're woke up so we can have a great dear day here at the Ag Tourism Workshop. A couple of housekeeping items. One is that we're here as an educational day. We want to find out from one of the experts that we brought into town from all the way from OMAC, who's traveled the country and doing ag tourism, to tell us it, what is ag tourism, what are some best practices that are taking place out there that, that we can implement then here in Thurston County. Today is an opportunity for us also to learn some best practices from people who are already in the ag tourism business here in Thurston County as well. Today is not a day to debate anything about what we're trying to accomplish at the moment. So if there's something you're here to try to debate, we will ask that we not debate that. I'm going to be the housekeeper on that. And so I will ask you actually to leave our building if that's something that you came here to do today. We want to have fun. We want to be educational. We want to learn. And we're more than welcome to have a debate later about anything about ag tourism. But today is about education and moving forward with our ag tourism project. So a couple other housekeeping things. We have a survey on your chair. So if you'd like to fill that out at, at, at the end of the day, if you'd like to be put on our email address list so that you can be contacted about future things that we're doing with the ag tourism as we develop ag tourism, fill your email in there as well. And once you fill in your survey, then bring that to me at the end of the day because then I'm gonna give you the book, Agritourism Cultivating Tourists on the Farm that Curtis Buse has produced. And this is an actual book that people pay for, and so we have actually paid for that. The Visitor and Convention Bureau has paid for that today to make sure each one of you get a copy. But we're going to wait, and so that you do the whole day, fill out the survey. When you turn your survey into me, then I'll, I'll hand you a book. And uh, Curtis, would you sign anybody's book? You no, absolutely. For, for 50 cents. 50 cents, he'll sign your book. So. <laughs> The other thing is that we're also going to hand out to you cards. So if you have questions for our panelists or anybody, you can fill out the card and hand it in to one of us. Lucas, you want to come forward so people can see Lucas? Becca, would you be a person as well that they hand cards? Becca, if you come forward too, so you can see. And Lucas, which side of the room do you want to work? I'll be over there in the back. So he'll be in the back there. You can, it, with either Becca or Lucas, so just give them to them, then we'll hand them to the panelists and address the questions. What we want to do too is if there's like three of the same questions, we'll just put them into one card and then ask the panelists to answer the question like and that. And just quickly say there's pens back there as well, so if you need a pen. There's okay. pens at the, at the yeah. table as well. Thank you. To go over the agenda today, we're going to have a welcome from San Romero. At 9.30, we'll have Curtis come up and talk about ag tourism on the fire. At 10.30, we will have a break for 15 minutes. The restrooms, again, are right outside the store. On the right are the ladies. Go towards the exit, and on the left is the gentleman's room. Then at uh, 10.45, we're going to introduce Thurston County Ag Tourism Overlay District, and Mike Kane is going to be here just to talk about the Overlay District and what is involved in that. 11.45 we'll have a break, and then at 12 o'clock we're going to have in this room, getting to know your neighbors, we have a picnic lunch that's coming, it'll be in that room, it's th three different kinds of chicken and potato salad and cornbread, and just a chance to get together to know your neighbors and say what's going on with you in there. It's a chance where I've seen where people get to network and they find out, well, we have some things in common that we can work on as we move forward uh, after today and really build partnerships. Then at 1 o'clock we'll have a panel on best practices and we'll have uh, Carol Latin. La Carol, Carolyn's already here in the room. Where are you, Carolyn? There she is, Carolyn Latin. If you've not met Carolyn, you need to because she is a... Uh, I want to be careful how I say this about Carolyn. Because, but she's been doing this for a long time, over 37 years. She and I just did a thumbs up video recently and it was a joy to do. She sold 52,000 apple fritters last year. That's just one item. She processes two to 5,000 gallons of cider a week. So she knows what she's doing. She's been doing it a long time. She's going to be one of our panelists for there. We're also going to have Ryan Rutledge from the Rutledge Corn Bay. And Ryan is a social media expert as well and done a great job of promoting that. We have Rob Pope from Offutt Lake Resort and Chanel Shaw with the Hairnet Foundation will be here. And at 2 o'clock, then we're going to have a resource panel. Be brief with each resource, but to let you know what's available to you as you want to move your Ag Tourism project forward, who's here in the county, and then Curtis will come up and help wrap that up as well at 3 o'clock, and we'll have you out of here at 3 o'clock. We had um, some of our neighbors from the north came down today. We have Char, Bide, and Doug, right? Or Doug or Denny? Doug. Doug, Bide, over here, and they are with Freshly Doug's Vegetables, but she also brought to us 
of Four Seasons Farm Guide. This is the kind of examples that we're looking at, what can we do in Thurston County too, so we sure appreciate you coming down from Stanwood to be with us today. And she's also provided us with the door price drawing, so the Northwest Vegetarian book, so you can fill out either, give us a business card at the back, or we'll have a slip of paper you can fill, and just put your name on it, and you, you uh, will draw at the end of the day for this door price. So thank you so much for coming down and being with us. Lucas, anything I missed that you want me to say? Okay. Oh yeah, there's coffee. <laughs> there's coffee in the back to the right. There's still some streets, uh, treats back there as well. So, Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker. And I met her, uh, I knew her before, but I met her about 17 months ago when I took my job as the Visitor Convention Bureau Director. And they were working on something called Ag Tourism, Ag Tourism Overlay District, and they had an Ag Committee. And that committee was meeting on a monthly basis at the County Commission office. And I started to get engaged and found out what the passion was for it and why we wanted to help South County uh, to become a successful farming region and see what we could do to help bring more business to the South County. That kind of sprang up to say, well, what can we do for all the county and how do we just begin the process? So she's gonna do a welcome for you, but what I wanted to tell you is that committee is still meeting. We're moving forward and what we hope to do next year is actually put on a large ag festival in the county, probably in the fall, that has a showcase where people come, they get on buses, and they go experience ag tourism in our community. And then also we're working with Rutledge Corn Maze to say, can we have a large, that like the culminating on a Saturday night, a big hoedown and fun and food and those kind of things. So that's something that we'll be working on that came out of this ag group. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to County Commissioner Sandra Romero. today on a Saturday and um, George did introduce me so I don't have to reintroduce myself but I do have some really good news and not some not so good news about the state of agriculture in Thurston County but the good news first Thurston County has a significant farmland base and local farm economy we have over 68,000 acres of farmland represented by 3,338 parcels and a little over 1,500 individual ownerships. In 2007, Thurston County's farms generated an estimated $117 million in market sales. Through the growth of CSA's community-supported agriculture, demand for local organic foods and significant increase in organic pastures, there are over 2,900 acres of certified organic pastures in Thurston County. Thurston County ranks third after Skagit and King counties in terms of both the amount of certified organic acres and estimated value of organic goods compared to the other 17 counties in western Washington. Thurston County has six farmers markets, Olympia Farmers Markets, West Olympia Farmers Markets, Tomwater Town Center Farmers Market, Lacey Community Market, Tenino Farmers Market, and our newest Yelm Farmers Market. There are 43 farms, producers of food, fiber, and nursery stock in the county that do mostly direct sales at farmers markets, direct to restaurants, CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture, and farm stands, and so on. Now, the not so good news. Between 1950 and 2008, Thurston County lost 90,000 acres of farmland to urbanization. <clears throat> Results from a satellite imagery base study show that more than 32,000 acres of land 
were converted from intact forest lands, agriculture, and large expanses um, of shrubby vegetation to urban lands between 1985 and 2000. Between 1995 and 2008, the number of dairies declined from 21 to 9. The number of fryer operations has declined from 5 to 1. In the 70s and early 80s, there were over a thousand acres rotating corn and peas. There are no longer any large commercial growers of peas and sweet corn. I'm looking at Roy and he's probably thinking, hmm. In the past 20 years, two of the remaining livestock sale yards located within Thurston and Lewis County have gone out of business, leaving only two in all of western Washington. The average age of farmers in Thurston County is 57 years old. Farmers are finding it more difficult to sell land to the next generation of new farmers because young farmers cannot afford to purchase resource lands at market values. 75% of farmland is within three miles of an urban growth boundary. The majority of farmland is not within a long-term agricultural zone and thus not protected. Of the total land and farms, the majority is rented land. So, in an effort to preserve what agricultural land we have left, I, and with the support of my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Wolf is here, and staff formed a work group made of local farmers, wineries, business owners, planners, and farmers markets to develop the Thurston County Agritourism Overlay District. The ordinance passed earlier this year. It will help revitalize South County's economy. South County isn't as near to the urban centers. However, we as County Commission encourage all of you to use today as an opportunity to learn about agritourism no matter where you're located. So I'd like to thank WTU Extension, the Thurston County Economic Development Council, the Olympia Lacey Tumwater Visitor and Convention Bureau for partnering with us to make today's event possible. I would also like to thank all of the members of the Agritourism Planning Committee and Subcommittee many of whom are here today, for their creative ideas, hard work that have been the foundation not only of this event, but the future of agritourism in Thurston County. And lastly, I would like to thank all of the volunteers who got up and were here at 8 a.m. this morning on a Saturday when the sun is out, who are helping with this event. So now, we are really excited to have WSU Extension Director for Clallam County, Dr. Curtis Buse, with us today. Dr. Buse was formerly a Rural Economic Development uh, Specialist with Texas A&M University. And much of his professional work since 1993 has been devoted to promoting agritourism in the Pacific Northwest and other parts of the United States. With that, I'd like to turn over today to Dr. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Romero. Please can stay up there. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be with you today. Um, actually, I'm no longer in Clallam County. I'm somebody probably gave you some, uh, an old uh, bio, but uh, for 16 years I was in Clallam County until about a year ago, and I've transferred. I'm still with WSU Extension. I'm still a county director, but I am now in eastern Washington. I am in Okanagan County, which is a little closer to my roots. I grew up in Adams County, and Othello is my hometown. And as she mentioned, I, uh, after graduate school, I did go and work for a number of years in Texas. Through with, I was a state specialist with Texas A&M University and traveled most of that very large state, which has 254 counties as opposed to our 39, and saw a lot of diversity of agriculture and rural development and, 
And uh, that's when I really got started with agritourism was uh, some 20 some years ago back in Texas. But I came back to Washington and like I said, spent 16 years in Clallam County. And uh, <clears throat> in Clallam County, I got, I, I got there at about exactly the same time that the first lavender was planted. Has anybody been to the lavender festival in Clallam County in Squim? Uh, about a half a dozen of you. And it's grown into a pretty major agritourism uh, sub-industry, if you will, between the festival and the 30-some farms that we have. Uh, in fact, I've got a couple of slides at the end of my show here. Um, it generates about $4 million in economic um, uh, activity in the county each year. So, let me uh, pull up my slideshow, and I won't give you any more about myself, because uh, I've got a, I'm going to... You know, it's kind of like when I teach master gardeners or some of my cultivating success, my small farmers class, I tell them, be ready because I'm going to fill your teacup with a fire hose. We're here, here it comes. But I'm going to throw a lot of information at you, obviously, uh, and the, uh, uh, some of the more salient slides with information on that aren't just pictures, in other words, uh, I have handed out. I apologize for the color. My printer, one of the cartridges wouldn't work, so uh, it's kind of off on the color, but I think you can read everything. Let me pull this up. to the mic and to the, I, I, I tend to wander, I, when I speak I, I move, so this is a little hard for me to be stuck to a podium, but I'll do my best. Uh, this is actually uh, the, what we call the Sunny Farms um, Corn Maze and Pumpkin Patch, uh, uh, owned by the Schmidt family, who has Sunny Farms Country Market there outside of Squim, and uh, it's just one example, uh, in fact a fairly unique American example of agritourism, corn mazes are quite the phenomenon. Um, Let's see, do we have a clicker or do I need to run this from here? As far as advancing slides? I can run it from here, but it's just a reach. Not too bad. Actually, I wonder if I can move this up here. Here we go. Move this up. It's not a reach, such a reach. Sorry about the technical adjustments there. Put my specs on so I can read my own screen. So what is agritourism? That's, um, I think, the number one... Uh, Topic of the day. Well, let me. I, I want to do a little check-in with who's here. Um, how many of you are some type have some type of farm or agriculture production activity? Okay, it's about a third of you. How many of you are some type of government official or a representative agency or something? Okay, about a million other third. So there's about a third that I. How many of you are something else? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> what are you? Um, so we got a brand new ecotourism uh, tour operator. Yeah. So who is that? Are you here in Thurston County? Oh, cool. So uh, well, we'll have a talk later. I, I would like to have a conversation with you right now, but we won't do that. Um, so what is agritourism? Actually, I view agritourism as a subset of ecotourism, which is, for the last two decades, the fastest growing segment of tourism in the world and in the United States. So. Um, that kind of activity where people are getting out on the land is a big deal. But I'm not going to answer the question right away of what is agritourism. But I'm going to ask you, is that agritourism? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't it? Is that agritourism? Why is that agritourism? They're just picking strawberries. And they're buying strawberries. Why is that agritourism? Huh? <laughs> it's not from China. <laughs> They're on the farm. There's something I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out of you. I hope here in a few minutes. They're having fun. There you go. That's kind of almost what I was trying to pull from you right there. What is that agritourism? Could be, could be the farmer's you know daughter out there feeding the sheep, or it could be uh, some city girl out there you know experiencing uh, something for the first time. Ah, that's agritourism. Isn't it? Corn maze. We all kind of know that. How about that? Fishing on the farm pond. Could be, right? I'm going to throw lots of different pictures at you. Obviously, there's like a petting pan with goats there. How about a Christmas tree farm? Yes. Yeah. Pumpkin patch. Oh, yeah. What is that picture of? That's a big country villa in Italy. Is that agritourism? In much of Europe, especially, agritourism is, is really never, it's always been there in a way. Um, 
there is very, well, getting ahead of myself, but uh, I'll, I'll save that little tidbit for a moment. But country inns and so forth, lodging on, in the country has been there for generations. It's institutionalized. There are public-private partnerships. Uh, and in fact, most of the, uh, in Britain, for instance, all of the national parks are private land. There are no federally owned large blocks of land. And so they have worked together to gather groups of farmers and ranchers and landowners to partner with the, the, the British government to do the national parks. And the farmers, you have to be, in order to participate in this, you have to be you know, you, a, a working, producing farm. But most of the farms in these national parks uh, make as much or more income from their agritourism, their lodging, their services, their guide, tour guides, and so forth, as they do from farming. So it's very much uh, a big part of the economy in Britain and in Europe and in many other parts of the world. And in fact, in Italy in 1985, they, uh, because of the decline of rural areas, speaking, you know, the ag overlay and, and, and uh, Commissioner Romero mentioned the uh, decline in you know, by 90,000 acres or something like that of farmland since 1950. And that is not unique to Thurston County. Uh, it's throughout western Washington. And in fact, most areas of the nation that are in or near uh, urban and suburban areas have just seen agriculture just almost be obliterated. But uh, the Italian government actually codified a uh, law that, uh, again, partnered with folks to create, like that one picture I showed you, of these, take these old country houses and properties, and now there are thousands of them, they call agriturismo, and that are part of a network, and the government actually manages the program and book, does a lot of the booking and the promotion and so forth. So there's a very tight partnership in many nations. Uh, in this nation, of course, there is no federal government involvement, but various state governments have gotten involved. Uh, is Sue here yet? Sue Davis? I think hopefully not, she's not coming in the Oh, she, in the end, she yeah. says she's not coming? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Sue Davis is with the State Department of Agriculture, and she and I uh, participated recently in another program, and she's very interested, in, even though their program uh, has been cut for small farm and direct marketing, just as where George used to work with the State Tourism Office has been cut short-sighted in my opinion. Uh, I know we're in tough economic times, but tourism is one of the bright spots, frankly, uh, in the economy, and uh, I think needs support. But so in, in Italy, anyway, that's a big deal. And in many other countries as well, I could give other examples, but just give you a couple of examples there. Again, farm holidays in England, look at this, it says 20% of the farms in England provide some type of service enterprise. 10% of the farms throughout England provide overnight accommodations, okay? Average is ten to fifty thousand dollars additional income, and uh, sixty-three percent of the farmers in the UK uh, are involved in tourism in some way. Over half the farms, uh, and that kind of and in, in mostly in Europe and in other areas, agritourism is almost synonymous with farm. What we come to call it now a farm stay, a farm vacation. Some people are calling them haycations. A uh, little tongue-in-cheek thing there. Um, <clears throat> Because, uh, well, I keep wanting to get ahead of myself, but uh, you know, a lot of people are looking to get back to the land. A lot of people, you know, think about it. Um, how many of you have a direct family member that owns a farm? If you're not a farmer, those of you who are not farmers. Oh, that's, that's unusual. With only less than 2% of the population living on farms anymore, very few people have relatives, especially when you get into the, the cities and so forth. Uh, back two, two generations, certainly three generations ago, virtually everybody, because a third of the population lived on farms, had a direct relative, a, a grandpa, a grandma, a grandma, grandma, an uncle, somebody, that they could go visit the farm on vacation. That is not the case anymore. And so th this is something, these farm stays, farm vacations, people are learning to get back and experience farm life to some level. Okay, so I'm going to throw up a bunch of pictures and I, I'm just going to go through them real quick. Uh, I want to say this, this whole screen of pictures I'm going to go up actually comes from, I heard uh, Commissioner Romero, I think it was her that mentioned, you're thinking, or was it George, uh, about a, some kind of a fall festival, farm festival you're talking about? In Collin County, actually in 1997, we started what we call the, the Harvest Celebration, which now, I think there's 14 counties in the state that do some sort of October Harvest Celebration. And we actually open the doors to 10 farms. It's quite a big hoedown, if you will, and usually have some kind of a big dance and dinner uh, on Sunday, and then, uh, or excuse me, Saturday night, and then a dinner on Sunday, dance uh, Saturday night. And we open 10 farms. It's kind of like, 
Think of it as the county fair, but on the farm, where people go out and get tours and take hay rides and get to milk a cow and get to, you know, and there's usually food and music on many of the farms and so forth. And it's, we, we, we did that, and in fact, when we started that, and to this day, in Clallam County, we don't advertise it outside the county. We, it's agritourism, but we view it very much as education for our citizens to try to reconnect them, because most of them think agriculture is a dead industry in the county. And I suspect many of the people in this county view it as very unimportant, as opposed to what, 117 million or something like that, you said, is the farm gate value or the, the economic impact. That's still a pretty major industry. It may be a small percentage, but it's very important in certain areas, I suspect, especially in what, what uh, you're calling the South County. So here's a bunch of kids playing on a sandbox. Anyway, these are photos that I've taken over the last few years from our uh, Clallam County Harvest Celebration, which happens every year on the first Saturday of October. You know, so there's again some kids uh, with a little miniature Hereford. That's a woman actually doing a herding demonstration. You can't see the sheep, but that's her sheepdog there, and she's giving him commands and, and demonstrating to the visitors at that farm. Sheep herding, here's a, a pack of farm. This is actually music. Squim Marimba, which is a local marimba band out at Nash Huber's farm out at Dungeness. Kids making uh, what I call Mr. Mr. Squash Head or whatever. They take squash and, and pumpkins and potatoes and kohlrabi and carrots and all kinds of things and make these heads like a Mr. Potato Head out of real vegetables, though. They have a lot of fun with that. And that's just a picture of all the parents helping the kids doing that out of Nash's farm. Uh, cheese making demonstrations. Here's a cider pressing demonstration. Pony rides. Uh, Antique farm equipment displays, spinning, you know, just experiencing getting to touch a real cow. Hey, you know, hay rides out through the field, <laughs> riding a tractor. You know, just kind of having fun with hay bale uh, sculptures there. That's a, that's a round bale made into a farmer and his pig. Uh, that's a, a, one of our 4-H leaders uh, doing a, a petting pen at one of the farms. Again, a, a cow milking demonstration, sheep shearing demonstrations, pumpkin patches. This is one of our local wineries doing a tasting and a tour of the vineyard. Again, another picture of the, 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 one of the gourd heads or whatever, girl getting to milk a cow. That's just a big bin of barley. The kids just play like a sandbox. They have the ball just playing in the grain. You know, out picking raspberries, eating watermelon, petting the goats. How about that last one? Is that, that's not from uh, the tour. I threw that in. Is that agritourism? It's a pheasant hunt. In eastern Washington, where I am now, over in Okanagan County, and, uh, it's a big part. Many farms get to, uh, income literally from leasing out uh, their farmland for hunting and fishing and so forth. So, and we consider that part of agritourism. How about that? It's birding. Is that agritourism? That's ecotourism for sure, but if it's happening on a farm, in a way it's agritourism, is it not? How about that wedding right there? Is that agritourism? Well, you don't know, but I, I will tell you that that happened on a ranch up in Republic, Washington in Ferry County. And many farms and ranches now are hosting weddings and family reunions and special events. Is that agritourism? These folks are out to dinner. I wish Sue were here from the State Department of Agriculture because they have a brand new program that they're calling Agriculinary Tourism. And they're putting together these culinary tours so you can go to restaurants in your community or your area that actually serve local food and feature it and tell you where it comes from. And you can visit the farms that uh, directly sell food and so forth. So uh, it's kind of culinary, tying to the culinary experiences, uh, very much part of this whole back to the you know, local community-based agriculture and so forth. That is an interesting picture. That is a chef, the woman in white, and a couple of her assistants on a farm cutting up a goat. Okay. And uh, I will show you a slide later of this farm. It's a very unique agritourism enterprise in eastern Washington. Do anybody know where that is? That is a barn, and if you can't see that little tiny picture, there are four chamber musicians, world-class musicians, playing music in that barn. Does anybody know where that is? That's, that's near Port Townsend. That's the Olympic Music Festival, where, again, world-class uh, musicians come in and play music in the barn. Some of the folks are on the grassy hill out behind with the donkeys and, and the goats and so forth. This is again Republic Washington, you know, trail riding on a farm. Uh, wineries are, you know, we don't think about it, but really wineries are a major agritourism, have been for 20 years now anyway in Washington. Uh, we are the second largest wine producing state next to California. We're a ways behind them, but we're a ways ahead of, the, of number, number three, which is Oregon. 
Washington is getting recognized for, for that. But camping on the farm, even snowmobiling, winter activities on the farm. This is the Squim Lavender Festival. These are just images over the last few years from the Squim Lavender Festival, which is again a community-based festival tied to a sub-industry that's become a four million dollar contributor to the local economy up in Clallam County. So, what is agritourism? What's a lot of things, isn't it? You said fun. And I'm going to define, I'm going to put up a couple of definitions in a minute, but before I put this long laundry list of, of activities, we'll just kind of go through them, many of which you just saw pictures of. To me, I want the, the thing that distinguishes agriculture from agritourism is the experience. Okay? If you are selling or providing an experience that's hopefully fun, educational, nostalgic, whatever, in addition to providing product, which of course that's what agriculture does, is provides our food and fiber to us. But if, it, if in doing so, the experience is something that the person is paying for, well, in most cases paying for anyway, uh, receiving as a customer, then I would say you're in the agritourism business. So, B&Bs and other lodging, camping on the farm, farm festivals, farm tours for adults, farm tours for school children. Do you do any kind of, do you work with the schools and bring groups of school children out to, no, yeah. to the corn maze? Yeah. And Latin, oh yeah, Latin, I haven't met uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Latin, I guess I'll meet her soon. Uh, but my brother actually used to uh, own a business down the Tri-Cities called uh, Country Mercantile, and they brought out, I think, average two or 3,000 kids out of the Tri-Cities every year. And you know why they did that? They made a little bit of money, maybe. They kind of charged a couple of dollars a head, or it was very cheap. But that was one of the major marketing and educational activity to bring the families out on subsequent weekends and so forth. Uh, animal attractions of all kinds, displays and so forth. Like I mentioned, weddings, family reunions, birthday parties, corporate outings, all kinds of demonstrations, cider pressing, cheese making, you know, wool spinning, you name it. Again, the nature activities that can happen on a farm, the ecotourism kinds of things. And then all kinds of outdoor activities that we do, you know, in parks and in, in, in public areas, in certain farm settings uh, can be provided and done very well of the cre what I call the created attraction, the corn mazes, the, uh, the, the uh, hay bale mazes, uh, uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, wagon rides, you know, of all types, both winter and, and summer, you can do this places in Vermont and other places that do major activities with sleigh riding, the, the pumpkin patches and, and so forth, uh, horseback riding, uh, roundups, branding, calving time, so forth on the ranch, food service on the farm. Uh, a lot of people, now this is one of those areas, and I'm not sure how your ag overlay district is going to handle this, but many people, when they, when, when they go on a vacation, when they're going out for you know, recreation, they need to eat. And um, how you handle food service is, is kind of a, a, tick, a ticklish issue. When we do our, our fall harvest celebration, or uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, our harvest celebration in Clallam County, well, a lot of the farms go out and, and get a, a, a permit to serve you know, food for the day. And somebody gets a food handler's card and so forth. Um, but if you're going to do that on an ongoing basis, then there's some, some issues with licensing and, and so forth. Um, music and theater on the farm. I've seen Shakespeare performed on the farm in Vermont. You know, what an experience, outdoor setting in a beautiful setting in the fall with the fall color and, and watch, uh, you know, watch some theater. Bringing in vendors, this is often done in conjunction with the festival, but again, bringing in all kinds of vendors with crafts and arts and food and so forth to the farm. Uh, cooking and culinary classes and events on the farm. I mentioned the, the, the short picture of the woman cutting up the goat. There's a farm that's become world famous now in eastern Washington for doing culinary classes, world-class teaching in a very rustic farm on uh, uh, culinary, uh, on, on uh, basically uh, sort of farm to, 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 to chef, if you would, connections. All kinds of educational seminars, farm museums, haunted attractions. Do you guys do any kind of haunted, you know, obviously a lot of fun since, you know, things like pumpkin patches and corn maze coincide with Halloween. Uh, there's all kinds of haunted act activities and attractions that you can do around that, and many others. You know, it's almost an endless list. Your imagination really can go on and on and on. Pardon? Paintball. Yeah, in the corn maze, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, who would, who would have thunk it a few years ago? Paintball. Okay, so this is, I mentioned before that, you know, there's direct marketing, 
In fact, I'm going to put a picture up here. What is direct marketing? Sort of cutting the middleman out, right? Selling between the farmer, direct to the consumer. That's what a farmer's market is the quintessential example of, correct? Okay, what about this one right here? Here's somebody, they didn't, let's assume you know, there's the scales, there's the strawberries, there's a tractor in the background. Let's assume this person didn't go out and you pick this, but they drove out to the farm to buy that little bag of strawberries. Is that agritourism? Is that just direct marketing? Remember, how did I define agritourism? <laughs> it's the experience. Now, could that person have bought strawberries at the grocery store? Yeah, might even got them cheaper. They may not have been as fresh or as good or as tasty. Probably would have come from California. But why did that person go out there? Maybe just for the quality. But I would argue many people who go to farm uh, roadside stands and, and farm stores and things like that do it for the experience as much or more than to buy the product. Therefore, that merges into the area of agritourism. Okay, now here's again some kids going on a, on a wagon ride. Is that agritourism? It's definitely an experience. What if they're not paying for that wagon ride? But what if they're on the way out to the pumpkin patch? You see, again, we're marketing pumpkins and we're selling them at a premium price and so forth. So again, the experience and the marketing get wrapped up together. Now, this is actually a farmer's market. This young man is selling some produce to this woman. Is that agritourism? You mentioned you have five farmer's markets in the county, correct? Um, are those agritourism? They are. In my, again, because most people who go to farmer's markets, we've done lots of survey work and, and research on this, they do it because they want to support local farms, they, they, you know, they want fresh, they want this, they want that. But farmer's markets are fun places, fun places to visit. And, you know, last time I went through Walmart, which was a while ago, uh, to, buy, <coughs> excuse me, to buy groceries, or any big supermarket, I'm going to pick on Walmart, um, it's really not a fun experience. Do you enjoy jostling with the, the shopping cart and waiting in line? And, no, it's not a fun experience. It's very utilitarian. When we go to a farmer's market, that's why I tell people who sell at farmer's markets, I do a lot of speaking on that too, how to merchandise. And it, you're, on, you're on stage. You should think of yourself as performing when you get to the farmer's market. You're, not, you're, not, you're just not sitting back there. You shouldn't be idly waiting for somebody to place an order. You should be selling, and you should be you know, viewing yourself as, uh, as, as again, as, as providing an experience, being part of that experience. People want to know the farmer. They don't want to just know the food is local. They want to know who produced it and something about them. Okay. So the idea, again, direct marketing, agritourism, are really wrapped up pretty tightly together. They're, they're hard just to completely separate out. And, and you, we don't need to. There's no need to. Need to. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time with these, but these are these these are in your handouts here. These are. I'm just going to put all three of them up, and I won't even read them. But I, these are. There's various definitions. You know, I'm not sure that any of us any of them is a definitive definition. I tell, I'll read the last one because it's and it's the, the the oldest one. A fellow named Duncan Hilchey at Cornell University started doing some of the original research on agritourism back in the early 90s. He wrote, generally speaking, an agritourism enterprise is a business conducted by a farm operator for the enjoyment and education of the public and to promote the products of the farm and thereby generate additional farm income. Again, marketing, enjoyment, fun, education, connection. That's, I think that's about the best definition I've seen, but there are many of them out there working. So, we kind of know what it is, right? Does that look like agritourism? I don't know, but I love the picture. It's cute as can be, isn't it? Um, but how do you get in and develop an activity, you know? Uh, I give a lot of talks. In fact, I've got a grant right now. I'm doing some training uh, in eastern Washington with folks who, who are either just getting started or want to start an agritourism enterprise. And they're often asking me, you know, okay, well, what should I do and where should I go? And, and it's like, I can't tell you that because you really have to, have, you know, do you remember what, what the Cheshire Cat said to Alice when she asked that question, you know? I wonder if you can help me find my way or whatever it was. Depends on where you want to go. So, and that depends for you as farmers and entrepreneurs and so forth, as well as you as a county. Where do you want to go? What's your vision of the future? Okay? What does it look like? Again, when I teach, I teach a variety of programs, including what we call Cultivating Success, which is our small farm education program. And I start right up front with, what is your vision? 
and then take that vision and you have to be able to at least verbalize it and better yet put it on paper. What is it you're trying to create? You know, if you don't know, then you're, you know, you're likely to create anything and it's not likely to be what you would want or what your neighbors want or, or so forth. Okay, so you know, how do you decide which activities that you're going to get involved in? Those dozens that I named and again, everything to, to paintball or whatever on the farm uh, that you could imagine and so forth. And you know, one of the things, I, I want to take a step back for just a moment because um, how many people have been to Knott's Berry Farm? Most of you, half of you anyway. Did you pick berries when you were at Knott's Berry Farm? <laughs> Why not? Were there any berries to pick? Nope. Well, there were at one time. Yes, there were. That was a berry farm. Okay, and Remlinger Farms in, up in Carnation, Washington, King County, they actually still do produce berries, but now they've got, you know, it's, it's, it's not rivaling Knott's Berry Farm, but it's, and so one of the things that happens, in, and, and I'm, and I'm, I want, I want to say, you need to be careful, or at least again, you need to understand what it is you're trying to create. Are you trying to create Knott's Berry Farm? Or are you trying to create ways for real farms to stay in agriculture and provide services and, and keep the land uh, in production and in open space and so forth? And I tend toward the latter. I'm not really interested in creating Knott's Berry Farms. I'm nothing against, you know, and again, if it gets engulfed by the city and so forth, then a farm can certainly evolve into a major amusement park. But for the most part, when I, when I talk about agritourism, we're talking about ways to turn a working farm into a more viable working farm, okay? To sell experiences and so forth and to add value to products so that we can create additional income. So what type of operation most makes, makes the most sense for me or for you? Well, it depends on a bunch of factors. A big, big, big one. Uh, what was your name, Mr. Rutledge? Ryan. Ryan. I asked him as, as I was sitting there earlier where his farm is. He says it's just about a mile and a half right off of, off of I-5, and it's on a major road, easy to find, right? If you were six turns down a gravel lane, dead end, out in the middle of nowhere, would that help or hurt your business? It would hurt your business, wouldn't obviously. Location is critically important. Now, I'm going to give you examples later of farms that have gotten over or around compensated for very poor locations, but having a good location is really, really important. The clientele. Who are you trying to reach? You know, in western Washington, you've got a huge clientele, both local as well as tourists who come here for other things, okay? So you've got, but even within that, there are market segments, and you need to figure out who it is that you're trying to reach with your type of activities. What is the local economy already? You know, and that has to do with, oops, you know, I thought something else was coming up next, but, but how, how much capital do you have? Is what you're trying to do going to be capital intensive? Some agritourism is much more capital intensive than others. And I always tell people who are starting up, do not bet the farm on this. Okay? Don't go borrow a bunch of money and mortgage the farm to do this. A farm that's already almost underwater isn't likely to survive just simply because they add agritourism. You need to be a good farmer to start with. I'm not saying you, you, shouldn't, you, you want to generate additional income, but if you're already in, in deep doo-doo, this is probably not the way to get out. Um, what are the products, again, that you're selling? Is the agritourism the product primarily? Are the experiences and activities the product? Or are you providing those activities to draw more people to your store, to your stand, uh, so forth, to your farm, to sell more product? That relationship between product and value added and sales and experiences and, and, and are we charging for those experiences? Uh, this is a difficult thing sometimes for people to figure out is should I charge for something? How much should I charge for something? How much are people willing to pay? Uh, anybody, anybody been to Disneyland lately? What did it cost per person? hundred bucks to get in maybe? I don't remember. There's like 50 bucks. I don't uh, 50 bucks. Out of it's expensive anyway. Now you come out and, and I've been there a couple times, took my kids there, you know, when as a kid, took my kids there when they were young. Um, it was okay. I was exhausted at the end of the day, and I think they were exhausted, and, and frankly, it's not that memorable. And yet, some of the activities in nature and just some, uh, you know, I, didn't, I grew up on a farm, so I didn't really visit them for fun, but I'll guarantee you that folks who go out and spend a day or two on the farm, if it's done properly, is a 
far, far more precious and memorable experience than going to, to Disneyland. So why couldn't we charge 50 bucks a day to come visit the farm? Well, you still have, you got to make sure that you know that it fits and so forth. But my point is, sometimes as entrepreneurs in agriculture, we're reluctant because oh, we're just some little dirt farm, you know. We don't want to charge. We've got to be able to, to sell those products and those experiences. What amenities do you have in and around your farm? Do you have a beautiful pond, a beautiful view, uh, and so forth? Do you have a, a wood lawn? You know, what, what, do, what do you have? Labor is a huge issue in deciding agritourism. How many people do you hire, Ryan, in peak season? Uh, 25. 25 people seasonally. How easy is it in September, October to hire 25 good people for a month? I bet it's not very easy. And people who have good people skills that are trustworthy and so forth to be able to do what you need them to do. It is a difficult task. And so you and having them available when you need them and so forth uh, it is something you, you have to wrestle with. Neighbors, okay? I have seen numerous cases where big contention has come about because people have started some type of an agritourism enterprise. Uh, it's grown beyond what the neighbors and maybe the owner originally thought, so forth. Um, You've got to be able to work with your neighbors. Now, in most cases, neighbors are fine. In fact, they like having agritourism next to them. But you better make sure that you work with, keep informed, you know, take a gift basket occasion to your neighbors, do something for them uh, at all, you know, especially if you're inconveniencing them in any way. How many people know where Green Bluff is, north of Spokane? George does, and one other person. North of Spokane is an area called Green Bluff, where there are about 20, 25 farms that are part of the Green Bluff Growers Association. And in the late summer to summer, yeah, mid to late summer through the fall, virtually every weekend there's some big festival or something going on up there. It's a major agritourism area. A lot of the other locals don't like it very well because the roads are choked, especially on the weekends. It's provided a lot of income and so forth, but you've got to deal with issues of infrastructure and is issues of traffic and so forth. If you're getting, especially, the Squim Lavender Festival is the same way. There's a lot of folks in Squim that just leave town that weekend because you can't get anywhere. Because it just, you know, but that's a big festival. So those kind of things, and it's different than, you know, some things happening out across the landscape. But my point is, uh, you've got to, you got to be able to, to understand and, and deal with those things. Um, can't hardly read that, but other nearby attractions. Again, piggybacking, packaging activities, how can you work with other things that are complementary and so forth to what you do to make... Again, people are probably not going to come to your farm, um, for, for very far anyway, for just to come to your farm, unless it's you're, they're doing lodging or something overnight. But if they're coming to the corn maze and then they can go out to the Latins and sip some cider and maybe listen to a country band in the evening or whatever, okay, make an itinerary a day out of working with things and regulations. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a, a little bit of a laundry list of regulations in a minute that you need to think about, but there are a lot of them and you need to work within them and work with your public officials. Do not be contentious. It doesn't do any good. Um, that doesn't mean that if they initially say no, there isn't a workaround. I've seen many workarounds happen, but uh, when you start bumping heads, that usually the public officials work. When the, the, the regulators usually win when you bump heads. That's my experience anyway. But the most important thing in, is what are your interests, what is your personality, what are your talents, what's your ambition, what's your vision, okay? All these other things you need to take into account, but first of all, if you don't get up excited in the morning to do it, you're probably not going to succeed at it. Why? Because this is tough. This is a hard thing to do. It's, and, and if it turns your crank and starts your motor or whatever, you're much more likely to do it than if you don't like it. Why would you do it if you don't like it? This is actually a, a, a picture a few years ago of my property in Squim, which is for sale, by the way, because I just moved to Omac. So uh, a little advertising, you want to move by 30 acres and swim in a beautiful place. But uh, actually, when uh, my wife and I, in fact, we're probably still going to semi-retire. We're looking at buying 40 acres around Omac and uh, dabbling in some agritourism ourselves. Okay, so uh, when I teach, I go into whole lectures on this about how do you develop your property and the resources that you have and so forth, Every, everything from the land, as well as all those other things that I just mentioned. And I, um, so, <clears throat> you know, you really do need to dig deep, assess what you have, uh, either as an individual or as a community. 
you know, inventory what you have, figure it out, how do you make it work together in, in harmony and so that it really works. And only after you've done all that hard work should you spend money or even much more time implementing your plan. Until you really have put it down on paper and can explain it to other people and so forth, have a, some kind of a business plan or at least a good farm plan, uh, I really don't recommend you jump into something like this. So I always tell people, vision, 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 vision. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by the, uh, the French author Victor Hugo, who said, there is nothing like a dream to create the future. Think about that. Anybody who I would argue, almost anybody who's done something spectacular or really, you know, impressive, amazing in their lives, they had a vision, and they were captivated by that vision. But a vision is not enough, you know. You've got to then start to focus and bring that vision down to something that is a plan and be able to instrumentalize that, that vision and that plan, okay? It's something again that you run. So what do you want to be? Who are you trying to reach? How can you best get there and develop a plan? Stage it, maybe 5, 10, 20 years, depending on how far, you know. You really are far, far better off if you can do that. Okay, so you really need to determine what you have when you start out. So I'll just go through kinds of resources. The human resources, the skills, the interest, uh, the, the labor, and so forth. What are you, again, I talking about what's your personal interests? If there are other family members or a partner of some type involved, what are his, what are his or her interests? and so forth, and how can you capitalize on them? What kinds of experience, skills, training do you have that will help you to, uh, to develop this activity? Um, and when I say social networks, I'm not talking about Facebook, all that could be part of you, talking about them as social networking or social media, but social capital in, in, in a sense. The people who are the most successful in hospitality-based businesses, which agritourism certainly is, are people who are really social and who are well networked and know a lot of people and so forth. Um, and then labor, how much family labor avail availability? Do you have neighbors or friends that are willing to work for you that do a good job? Do you have to go out and hire people? Do you have to train people and so forth? And maybe most importantly, what are the human skills that you lack, that you need? You really need to be honest in, in, with yourself and say, okay, you know, and if, for instance, I tell people, you know, if you're kind of antisocial, which some farmers are, I'll admit, um, and you just like to ride your tractor, and you know, then you're probably not the one that should be meeting and greeting the public. Maybe, maybe your wife or a kid or somebody else should be, right? You just continue to run the tractor and smile if you can. Your financial resources, you know, what you have in mind, what you can you really afford, right? But realize again, don't bet the farm on, and spend a lot of money. Some paint and elbow grease and, and hard work and, you know, cleaning things up and sprucing things up. It goes a long way. It's way more important than going out and building a whole bunch of new facilities or something. By the way, that's Shelburne Farms in Vermont, which uh, I visited. is an amazing place, um, which is a major agritourism destination in Vermont. So, again, what are the physical resources you have? What are the buildings? Can they re be repurposed? Fencing, you know, all kinds of equipment, other things, building materials, wells and water supply, what kind of electrical do you have, and infrastructure, and, and so forth. Uh, computers and software, and goes with the skills as well. What you know, you're going to need a website. You're going to, you know, how are you going to, uh, you're going to do that yourself. You're going to hire that done, whatever, and other things. What kind of natural resources? We, you live in a beautiful area. All I would argue, most of Washington State is a, is a spectacular area in one way or the other. Where I just moved to is very beautiful up in the Okanagan Valley, but it's far, far different than the Olympic Peninsula where I moved from or from here. But they're all very beautiful and, and have a lot to offer in terms of scenery and water resources, soils. Obviously, that's very important as a farmer, knowing your soils and what they can produce, what their limitations are. Your climate, your vegetation, your acreage, and other things. And then I already mentioned the location resource. So here's I'm going to give a few examples. This is called the Apple Barn and Cider Mill. It's in a place called Sevierville, Tennessee. Does anybody know where Sevierville, that sounds terrible, isn't it? Yeah. If, if you've been to Sevierville before, have you been stopped at the Apple Barn? Uh, uh, but Sevierville is close to what? Uh, Dolly, Dolly. Do Dollywood is there at uh, Pigeon Forge, which is just down the road from, from Sevierville. What else? I just heard Smoky Mountain National Park, Gatlinburg. Knoxville is, close. Knoxville is very close by. 
Uh, it is a major tourism destination. I, I, I could tell a whole story about this, but suffice it to say, this individual who owns this was a pharmacist who semi-retired and now has one of the biggest tourism, certainly the biggest agritourism enterprise in, in that region of the country. Uh, get well over a million visitors a year. Uh, they have, it's, it's incredible. I mean, there are, this place has an apple winery, an apple ice creamery, uh, two restaurants, an apple pie shop, an apple candy shop. The barn sells, has three stories of, of crafts and products and everything apple themed. Um, the, 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 the parking lot is like six or seven acres for this place. Okay, and it started out just simply selling apples and apple cider out of the barn. So, but the location, I mean, kill, I mean, millions of people go up and down that highway to the Smoky Mountains and to Gatlinburg and to Dollywood and so forth. And so he just piggybacked on that. So there's a great location. This is over by Peshaston near Leavenworth. This is Smallwoods Harvest here in Washington. And that's a great location, right on Highway 2, very scenic. You come around the bend, you just almost have to pull in because it's so beautiful, right? People are out there nodding their head and you've seen it. Great location. So locations are, are really good. Does anybody know where that is? Some people out there riding horses in the vineyards. Gives you somewhat of a clue. It's in Washington. It's in the Yakima Valley. It's near Zilla. I'll show you a picture later on of this place. But they have developed a what they call a, a barn and breakfast. And uh, they have people staying in teepees, and then they, they rent out horses, and they actually go on horseback rides from winery to winery, going on wine tours through the wine country on horse. Again, the location allows them to do that, right? This is a, a beautiful ranch up in, uh, again, Republic. That's the Kate Diamond K Lodge. It's, now, even though it's a beautiful location, it's very remote. So they struggle because they're very far out of the way. Now, this one is interesting. This is some folks. This is actually a graduating class from the Quilla Saskett Farm and Culinary School. I mentioned this earlier, the woman cutting up the goat. Does anybody know where this farm is? It's in Rice, Washington. Does anybody know where Rice, Washington is? It's north of Spokane. It's in Stevens County. It's more a place than a town. The nearest town is Chewila, but that's probably 25 miles away. You're probably 50 miles from Caldwell. Um, but these folks get world-class chefs and other foodies from around the world to come out and spend hundreds and sometimes a thousand dollars to stay for three or four days and learn to butcher a goat, and make cheese, and, 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 and then how to cook with it and, and so forth. They, they have developed quite the business in a very remote location. This is my favorite though. This is uh, the Apple Store in, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think, of, uh, Medina, Medina, Texas. And Medina, Texas was a dying little town on the road to nowhere out, about 75, 80 miles out west of San Antonio in the hill country. But again, it's, anyway, this guy, Baxter Adams, I could tell a whole slew of stories about this guy. Started a business called Adams Apples. And, um, but he has developed a huge industry that draws out tens of thousands of people to Medina for apples. In fact, he, put a, he developed what he called the Texas International Apple Festival. Now, Texas is not known for its apples. I don't know if you knew that or not. But he grows apples in Texas. And his claim to fame is he, he challenges anybody in, in the northern hemisphere to come to, his, to Medina the third weekend of July for their festival and have their, that year's crop compared against his crop. Because he has apples the third weekend of July. And we don't get apples until September, October. And so it's a tongue-in-cheek thing. He challenges, you know, it's a big international apple. Nobody ever comes, of course, <laughs> except people come from all over. Because originally the newspaper and, and the TV station came out to cover this, you know, this international apple festival's tongue-in-cheek <laughs> joke, right? But anyway, a good marketer can take a really bad location like Medina, Texas, and even make agritourism work. I always recommend people make a map of their properties, part of their plan. It help you see the whole picture, identify your assets, your problem areas, how things are going to work together, various scenarios. And so there's actually a map of my property that was, is up in Swim. And so I teach this, we, we go through, and, and I, I suggest they make a map the way it is now, what they want it to look like in five years, ten years. It helps with that visioning process and putting it down on paper. Okay, we're, how, it's, I don't have a watch on and I don't see a clock. How are we doing time-wise? Check in. Okay, so we need to wrap up pretty quick then, right? We, I don't know what time I got started, but I'm going to try to go through a lot here real fast. And I, we may not get through it all. 
But regulations are important, and, and also risk. And, and, and so liability insurance, legal issues, really you need to investigate that, work with your insurance carrier, make sure you're covered for the specific kinds of exposures that you have. It's, uh, Curtis? Yes? We'll, we'll break into the lunch hour a little bit, so do what you need to do to tell us, because you're, okay. you're the reason you're, the reason you're here is for us. Okay. So we want to hear what you're going to say. All right. We'll, move well I'm not afraid to talk. I've never we'll been afraid to talk. We'll break into the lunch. We we'll put a little leeway there. Okay, thanks, Jordan. You're the reason you're, we're all here. Wow, that, I feel really important now. <laughs> Um, okay, are you selling and serving food? If so, you're going to deal probably with state, uh, with county health uh, code, and in some cases, if you're processing certain types of food, you're going to have to deal with the Washington State Department of Ag. Retail sales, obviously, uh, unless it's food, you know, like you know, uh, uh, milk or potatoes or something that's uh, that's not a, a, a prepared food, uh, you don't have to collect sales taxes. But if you do have things that are retail, you're going to have to deal with sales taxes. Uh, I won't go into it, but petting zoos, they are technically under the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service of USDA. you got to go through them. Uh, business licenses, construction, you know, permits, and so forth. Building code, fire code, if you're going to be doing construction. For the public, there's something, there's, there's new code out there that's, and I wouldn't go there, but uh, we've run into some problems in the past because people want to convert an old log cabin into an overnight lodging. Have a fire marshal say, well, you've got to put a... A sprinkler system in that cabin then because that's transient housing it's the same as the hotel or or whatever uh, we need to, those are issues that are deal with zoning is a big issue it's something like an overlay zone but uh, you, you, dealing with existing zoning I already mentioned fire code traffic and parking I talked about especially if you're doing major festivals and events signs and signage you know I'm sure you have ordinances in that in the county <clears throat> where you can have a sign how big that sign can be one of the things that's really important for agritourism, since again it's often in not the most visible of locations, is to be able to have enough signage and quality signage to draw people out. And so Curtis, people can that's find one out. of the things that we're going to work on uh -huh. is signage and actually kind of a uniform sign and then Good. locate the farm. And what we want to do is follow up after today with you about what are some good. Good. You know. Uh, Years ago, and I haven't been up there in a lot of years now, but British Columbia had a great program where they actually vetted um, agritourism operations and, and they went through and if they got, anyway, approved. Thompson Valley? Well, I think it was, yeah, Thompson Valley, but also on uh, Vancouver Island up in uh, the, uh, what's the valley up there I'm trying to think of? Fraser? Pardon? Fraser? No, no, uh, uh, Cowichan Valley. Uh, and other places, they actually developed this network and they, again, they had sort of a uniform sign that let people know this is an approved or a recognized agritourism enterprise and so forth. So, That's one of the projects for our community for this country. Yeah. But again, in some areas, they, you know, be it state or county or whatever, um, they either won't allow you to have a sign or the sign is so small or something, but they allow you that it's, it, it's difficult to, to, to get seen. Labor issues, obviously L and I, and, and other things, and, and dealing with not only the other labor issues about quality of labor, availability of labor, but also dealing with the taxes and the regulations with hiring people. Uh, things like festival and event permits, water and septic <coughs> issues, especially if you're going to be doing lodging or something like that, providing you're going to have to have a different class of well, you have to get your water inspected, and many others. I would say many others. Now, I put this picture up. Can you see what that picture is right there? This, I'll give you a hint. This picture is in Sweden, and those little calves down there are brown Swiss calves. So this is a dairy farm in Sweden, and what are the kids doing? They're up there sleeping. They've got like a little bench loft up there in the hay. These are not the farmer's kids. There's, there's a tradition in Sweden, they call it, I forget, there's a, a Swiss name for it, but they, essentially it's called sleeping in the straw. And there are hundreds of farms around Sweden that offer lodging where you sleep in the barn with some nice clean straw right out there with the animals. I laugh because could you ever imagine trying to get that permitted? <laughs> well, I don't think it would be very easy uh, with fire issues and with, you know, E. coli and salmonella and all kinds of other things. But anyway. Just goes to show. I mean, I, I bet Sweden is a pretty darn regular, or Switzerland. I should say, I said Sw Sweden. I meant Switzerland, other SW country. Switzerland. This is in Switzerland. So, uh, but anyway, I know that that's a fairly heavily regulated state, and yet they allow something like that because it's traditional. 
What types of, I already talked about that, what are the skills and assets that you bring to the table? And then maybe more importantly, what do you lack? You really need to think about that. How much privacy and downtime do you need? You know, this is one of the things my wife, I'm a very public person and I love to interact and socialize. My wife's a much more private person, so we're going, it's usually the other way around often in, in many cases or couples I've seen, but um, you know, she's not so sure. So we're talking about agritourism and doing some things. Uh, I'm kind of the front person. She's more of the behind the scenes person. And you know, her privacy and downtime is, her needs are different than mine. Let's just put it that way. Uh, again, do you enjoy working with people, lots of people? You know, can you maintain a positive attitude even when you're really tired, when you don't feel like it, can you fake it? You know, that kind of thing. Because you're gonna have to. What are your passions and dreams? What are they for the rest of your family? You better make sure you're on the same page, at least with your spouse or your partner. Because when you're not, and you make an assumption, you may know what the word assume breaks down. Okay, enough said. What, what level of risk and stress can you take? Because you're going to deal with both to a certain degree. How much money do you hope or need to make from this? And is it realistic? These are not typically highly profitable things. Farms in general, especially small farms, are not highly profitable places. That's not to mean you shouldn't have financial goals, and you really should, but be realistic and, uh, and, and you know, have a plan to get there. And then what resources, financial and otherwise, do you have now that you can put into it? So these are just some, and you've got those in the hand out there. So. All right, some other important things to think about. All right, this is my, if, if nothing else, I want you to think about this one line. Remember, in agritourism, you're selling experiences as well as products. I would say the experience is way more important in most cases than the product. Maybe the product is the experience. Okay, so you're probably still involved in producing some types of products, but you need to really understand that you are in the hospitality and service industry and you gotta create experiences that are worth paying for. And because you're in the hospitality and service industry, um, most people who come to you are wonderful and you have a great time, but there are people that just, they were born on the wrong side. They didn't just get up in the morning on the wrong side. They were born on the wrong side of bed and they will challenge you. Okay? And like I've already alluded to this earlier, so when, you know, somebody really ticks you off and you're tired and so forth, you still have got to learn to deal with them. And that goes back to the deal that if you're not the person who um, can maintain that enthusiasm for people, that patience with people, and so forth, then either you shouldn't be in this business, or you better find somebody else to deal directly with the public. Uh, again, working within the government regulations that affect you is very important. I already talked about neighbor relations are really, really important. It must pay. Now, Working with small farms, I teach classes on, on business management for, for small farms. I teach people about enterprise budgets and cash flow and different things like that. And I, and I, and I, I mention enterprise budgets because I try to get them to separate out the major... A farm is a... We think of a farm as a, as a, as a business, but usually within a farm there are numerous businesses. If you think about it, each enterprise, this, the pumpkin patch, the corn maze, the strawberries, whatever it is you're growing, is kind of got to break it out and say, is that profitable in and of itself? Whether or not the whole farm is profitable, maybe the two things are profitable, one of them is really unprofitable, it's dragging down the whole farm. So the agritourism part needs to be separated out and it must pay, okay? It must pay. So you've got to figure out a way to, to break that out, budget it out, and make sure that it's paying, uh, unless you just love to do it. Yeah, Ryan? So then, is there, is there data out there, you know, so like I think of it per acre, okay, we've got to make this, you know, we only have so many acres if we want to do something, it's got to make sure that it's making the same per acre as, as this over here, mm -hmm. which is what's in what you're saying. Is there anything out there that says really sort of apples to apples shows? No, but the, what, what, what I would say is, again, develop, have you ever heard the term enterprise budget before? You know, there's a budget, you put up a budget for any, any business, but you should, you know, in your case, let's say you've got a 30-acre corn maze or something like that, okay, and you could develop, say if I'm just growing sweet corn, you know, develop an enterprise budget for that, but you could develop an enterprise budget that says, you know, here are my costs, this is my cost for, 
fertilizer and seed and this and this and, and labor and the whole thing and if I bring this many people through you should, you should develop one up front a pro forma budget and then you should compare it with the actual at the end of the season and then and then do that with what are, what are my alternatives if I were to use this land to produce whatever else how does it compare and that's the acre to acre basis but more important than acre to acre is take the enterprise be it the corn maze and figure out all the budget for it and try to separate it in, in farms it's sometimes very difficult how much do you charge of the tractor toward this versus that and so forth and that's sometimes a judgment call but you can do it okay uh understanding your market your peak seasons again uh Mar I'm going to have another slide, just let me back to the very next slide is on marketing. I mentioned, well, like, be flexible and adapt. Um, I, I showed you the picture of the apple barn and cider mill. Um, anyway, Bill Kilpatrick owns that place, and he, he had an original plan, but every year he added something new, and it was always based on feedback that he solicited from his customers. He listened, he was flexible, he adapted as he went. And then finally, again, enjoy what you do, because if you don't, you're in the wrong business. Okay, so marketing real quickly. Word of mouth. Have, you know, do things, have events, uh, tell people, and part of it is, you know, cultivate the media as best you can. Often, if you're novel and new, you can get free publicity out of the media. Uh, do collaborative marketing, again, with other people, like those, the farm map thing that George brought up. Uh, we have them, uh, and we have one in Okanagan County, we have one in Clallam County. And you should have them here. Anybody that's doing direct selling and agritourism and related stuff, have a map and a nice brochure and get them out in critical areas. Websites are critical and social media is becoming more critical uh, all the time. Working with people like George, visitor and convention bureaus or chambers of commerce is really important. They gotta know who you are and to tell your story. If they don't know who you are, if you don't introduce you, yourself to them, invite them out for a free barbecue or something at your place, whatever it takes to cultivate those people who are the gatekeepers of tourism, how are they going to recommend you? You've got to cultivate that yourself. Um, so it's your job to educate your community. Your community is not going to seek you out unless you are the proactive one. Uh, again, the school tours I mentioned, rack cards in key locations. Uh, mailing lists are more important today. Emailing lists, if you can get them, is, are really great. Uh, the farm maps I mentioned, the tourism maps and things like that. Signage, we've already talked about trying something that's professional but not over the top and it will help people find you. And the last thing I mentioned here is paid advertising in magazines and newspapers and radio stations and so forth. It's important, but that's not where you start, okay? That's not where you start. You can't spend a lot of money up front until, and you shouldn't, until you've done a lot of this other stuff. And, and believe that all that other stuff will pay more dividends than buy, spending a lot of money on paid advertising. Okay? So, tourism is changing. People are taking shorter vacations, more frequent vacations. They're taking vi vacations closer to home, taking weekend trips. They describe themselves now as knowledge seekers, as seeking enriching experiences and so forth near where they live. 30% of tourists today uh, characterize themselves as knowledge seekers. It's the primary reason they go out for, you know, a trip or, or whatever vacation is to learn something new. Uh, and they're seeking high-quality, genuine, real experiences. You know, I'm sure the, the big resorts and the cruises and that are, are doing just fine. But again, the fastest-growing area is, is ecotourism, nature tourism, agritourism, heritage-based tourism, in other words, history and so forth. People are willing to pay today for things that would have seemed, seemed silly to my grandfather, right? Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. Um, but that's a changing of the times and of the culture. You know, I already talked about in Europe, but the irony is the further people get removed from their roots in the land, in the soil, in nature, on the farm, the more they're yearning for those things. And that's why agritourism is in much demand today, because again, people don't have the natural experience of having either growing up that way or even having a relative that they can go out. And so it's a novel experience to them. Those of us who grew up on a farm just want to get that heck off, almost said the other H word, <laughs> getting the you know what off the farm. And, and then they get older and you want to go back. But uh, for many people, they, never, they just want to have that experience, okay? So I want to, basically you can read this, I won't read it because we're, we're long on time, but we're short on time and I'm long on wind. Um, 
But agritourism, according to people like Suzanne Morris and other experts, is absolutely the right thing at the right time. And people really want, the tourism industry, as she puts it, cannot find genuine, real experiences fast enough to meet the demand for people who want those. And that's what agritourism has in spades. So, setting your farm apart. Be genuine, unique, be authentic, be real, but at the same time, you know, have a lot of fun too. Be fun. Exceed people's expectations. I'm going to show you some examples. Provide true value. That doesn't mean be cheap. You shouldn't be cheap. You need to charge enough, but make sure you're providing uh, something that's very memorable, and very real, and, and it's a true value. I always recommend be famous for something. Figure out what your, your unique thing is. and be You can do lots of other things, but don't try to be all things to all people, but especially become known for at least one big thing to set you apart. And then make your farm beautiful and aesthetically pleasing and safe. Now let me just give you some examples. I'm going to throw lots of pictures at you here for a few minutes and then we'll be done. How about that one? That's, that's unique, isn't it? I just love that. that the, incredible, the, the incredible punk. That's the, uh, it's all made out of pumpkins. That, uh, that's, uh, but be genuine and authentic. This is Valley Shepherd Creamery in Long Valley, New Jersey, not too far from New York City. I'm just going to show you real fast. They can make old world sheep's cheeses and fluffy lambskins and blankets and, of course, grass-fed lamb. They have the sheep shop, both online on their website and at the farm where they have all kinds of sheep gifts. Uh, they have their newborn lamb celebration. They sell you poo compost. <laughs> they, of course, sell they have a, you know, world-class sheep, so they sell rams and breeding stock. They do cheese-making classes. They have a sheep-shearing festival in April. They do all kinds of parties and tours and things like that. I mean, so again, it's the experience, they've they got the products. They make world-class, old-world kind of sheep's cheeses, but then they do all these other things as well. So this was their website a couple years ago when I discovered them, I, and it's quite interesting because here's their website today. Look at the difference. It's pretty much the same information is there, but they've totally changed their image, and I think it's because they're going after a different clientele, a more upscale clientele in the New York marketplace, that they've changed their image a little bit. This is some various images from Remlinger Farms, which is Incarnation over in Snoqualmie Valley, uh, just north of here. And again, they have all kinds, you see the little steam locomotive, they've got a great farm store and a nursery and a pumpkin patch, and they do plays. And, they do ex uh, classes on beekeeping and composting, and they obviously do have berries and sweet corn and hay bale mazes and sculptures and all kinds of things, okay? My point is, people go away saying, wow, you can't see it all in one day. It's not quite Knott's Berry Farm, but it's getting there, but it's still a working farm. But I mean, they uh, just it's, it's incredible what they put together there. Um, and this is their website, or was their, no, this is their website, excuse me. And, and so this is in Vermont, this is Mountain Valley Farm. I mentioned develop your own signature event, okay? Focus of your farm. What do you think their focus is? It says right on the horse-drawn rides for all occasions. You can see summer, winter, so forth, that's what they're famous for. But they do weddings and parties, they offer cross-country skiing, maple syrup, honey and cider, they have wildlife and nature tours, a guest house, all kinds of things. But their signature event are their horse-drawn rides. And there's their website. Provide true value. This is again a small woods harvest in Peshasta near Leavenworth. Now here's a little honor system. This is their little, not little, it's a big kind of petting zoo. They call it their uh, farm, uh, the farm park. One dollar admission, you just drop a dollar in the, in, the, in the box. This was a really wet, up, yucky day, so there weren't very many people out there. Just let me take you on a tour. They got really nice, you know, amenities, chairs, old tractors and things around. Piglet Peak, offer things like, you know, that you pay extra for that. But they got alpacas and other farm animals. This is the front of the store, beautifully done. And then that draws you into here. Now, all that stuff out here is free, pretty much. Why do you think they have that beautiful setting and all that stuff going on for free or, say, a, 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 a donation of a dollar, you know, when you, when you come in? Because they want to get you in here. They want to get you in here. And most everybody goes in there, and most everybody buys something. So the outside stuff probably costs them money. That dollar helps maybe offset some of the cost, but that outside stuff is part of the draw to get them in the farm store. 
Okay? So you need to, again, that's, part, that's their business model. They're not charging much for the activity, but they're making the activity such a tr great value that people got to stop, and they're betting that most of them are going to come in the store and buy some stuff. So that was their website before. Now this is interesting. This is their website today. And it's not only much different. I, I decided what, what they're doing, because this is more about coming to the farm and doing stuff, this is about selling stuff. So I think they totally changed their website. I think they figured their website was not driving much traffic to the farm, but then now they're, it's become a web store, and their traffic is primarily coming from tourists going up and down Highway 2. So again, here's a little different thing on marketing when they've decided to change. So of all four of these places, again, are beautiful, <coughs> aesthetically well done, safe, clean, uh, as they should be working for, with the public. So what do you think of this? This is on a farm in northern Idaho. And they have these tents that you can rent with a little outdoor kitchen. And uh, this is on a farm. This is called Huckleberry Tent and Breakfast in Clark Fork, Idaho. And uh, it's a brilliant idea, I think, because it, you know, it's very inexpensive as opposed to building cabins or other things. It's very unique. It's well done. You can see nice beds and little stoves and mosquito netting and all kinds of things on these tents on a nice wooden platform with, uh, and so forth. Where do you think they got this idea? Has anybody ever seen this idea before? Mary Jane's. Yeah, who said Mary Jane? You get a star in for it. <laughs> uh, Mary Jane Butters is kind of the, the Martha Stewart of organic farming. Uh -huh. And uh, she kind of developed this idea of glamping, as she calls it, glamour camping, in these kind of fancy, poofy tents and whatnot. She's in Moscow, Idaho, believe it or not. She has her own quarterly journal or magazine that comes out, her own line of products, and has become quite the entrepreneur. So it's important to research, visit, and see other places to get ideas. Don't be afraid to borrow significantly from other people. Um, and go visit them. And take pictures if they'll let you. And ask them lots of questions. They'll just either tell you yes or no, or it's none of your business, but ask lots of questions. I really highly recommend that. Now, this was that place I mentioned earlier. Remember, there's the same picture of them writing. But look at the, the again, the, 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 I think it's like $220 a night or something to stay in one of these teepees and get up and shave in the morning with the ponies and go out and soak in the outdoor tub and rough it, you know, and then go out and ride the horse and, and go out to the wineries. What a brilliant idea. That's in Zillow out the Yakima Valley. It's called Cherrywood Bed, Breakfast, and Barn. Excuse me. Yes. I've, I've been there and she's a fabulous cook. I have not been. She's she fabulous. What? fabulous cook. Is she? Yeah. So, so does she provide meals too? Yeah, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I have not been there yet. I just discovered that one a few weeks ago on the internet. I, I'm going to definitely go visit that one. Yeah. 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 Cool. It's a great place. Now, this is one I mentioned. Um, this is Quilla Saskett Farm. And you can see there's their dining room. And they have many classes on cheese making and all kinds of uh, sort of back to the land food experiences. And they have world class chefs that come stay with them, sometimes featured chefs. Sometimes the chefs actually pay to come. And then other foodies who can come out and work with the chefs and so forth. And it's again, it's just a very simple little farm. They've actually written a book now called Chefs on the Farm. I highly recommend it. And that's their model. It's sort of culinary tourism on the farm. This is a ranch up in Republic, Washington, near where I live. It has a saloon and all sorts of things out in the lodge. It's quite an amazing place. K-Diamond K Ranch. This is in Arondo near Wenatchee called the Cider Works, the Arondo Cider Works, and they make fresh cider every day, and they have uh, the donut robot, you can see it in the middle, that's that little stainless steel contraption over there, making fresh apple donuts, the donuts actually made with apple cider, and just a, a really wonderful little place, it's right on the highway uh, coming between uh, Wenatchee and, and, uh, and Okanagan. It's a ranch up in Republic that offers summer, winter activities, lodging, snowmobiling, you know, sleigh rides, all kinds of things. Chihuahua River Ranch. This is, a, this is a blueberry farm that was a, um, this is a good example. In fact, it was a county commissioner who made this place possible. This is in Manson, Washington, in Chelan County, called uh, Blueberry Hill Farm. I think it's Blueberry Hill? Yeah, Blueberry Hills Farm. And these folks converted a bunch of their orchard into blueberries, and then they had this dream of having a little restaurant and a gift shop and everything on the farm. But it was not going to be allowed, and I guess they had a couple of neighbors who really were making it. You know about this, George? Yeah. You know the Sorensons? Yeah. Anyway, I understand it was a state legislator involved, and one of the county commission went to bat for them. Yeah. 
And, um, oh, it was Parlette that did it? She helped. Yeah, she's coming to visit us next week up in Okanagan. And uh, anyway, made it possible. And they have a beautiful little gift shop and cafe on the farm. And of course, they have you pick, pick blueberries and so forth. So it's, you know, it's just a wonderful asset to the community in the area. Now, this, this place, I'll just tell you, it's in Vermont. And we're running through some pictures. This is not when I was, I was speaking at a conference a few years ago in Vermont, in Burlington, at the university there. And I was out visiting, drove all over the state for a few days visiting agritourism places, and I came across, across this place on a Sunday, and all it said was Riverside Farm, and there was nothing else, and there was not a soul around. So I just drove around taking pictures. And I figured it had to be some kind of agritourism thing, but I couldn't figure it out. I, I, isn't that a beautiful place? So those are some of the pictures of Riverside Farm. What do you think that place is famous for? It is an agritourism place. What would that place be good for? High-end weddings. They put on big ticket weddings. That one building, that rustic old building, that's their dining room. So they bring in hot air balloons, all, all kinds of, they do very high-end weddings on the farm. I'm sure it was a working farm at one time. This is actually the old apple barn that was a beef barn at one time. Yeah, I mentioned the apple barn and cider mill in Sevierville, Tennessee. And again, they have yeah, there's a picture of Dollywood there, but they have everything you can imagine. This is the uh, apple candy factory here. There's the apple ice creamery. Here's some shots inside the gift shop, which is this whole barn. This is the apple pie shop and ice cream. Applewood Smokehouse. This is one of the restaurants. This is the apple winery, they call it. Uh, it's a whole apple campus there in Sevierville. <laughs> Believe me, it's amazing. And it's created other apple balls. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a he's got a, a sto big store in a mall in in Nashville. I know now too. Well, Orvis has moved in next door. And oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So this is this is a picture of their website. This is just a cute little farm. I'm actually I physically wouldn't like it, but I found this on the internet. You know, here's some images. Nursery Rhyme Park called Butterfield Acres, the real farm experience. As far as I can tell, this is not a real farm. <laughs> but they uh, they do birthday parties and events for kids. And then either they're on the farm or they bring the farm animals and things that go out to the, to the kids uh, and, and do birthday parties. So, you know, uh, agritourism can be themed as well, as well as, as not even a uh, real working farm. All I recommend in most cases should be about a working farm. This was a working farm. I mentioned this is Shelburne Farms in Vermont. It was a Vanderbilt family. Um, forget the guy's name. Anyway, the, it, but it, it was God going into disrepair. These buildings, let me just show you a few pictures. All have solid copper roofs. They're just amazing buildings. And anyway, this place is now a what a 1,400-acre working farm, but it's owned by a nonprofit. The community's gotten together, raised money, bought it, and they do all kinds of export. I saw Shakespeare on the farm out there, and, and amazing things going on. And, and they have a working dairy. They make cheese in, in the dairy. They've got farm animals. They do nature walks and tours and classes. And they have one of the buildings has been converted. They have people making like vintage furniture and all kinds of crafts and things in, in there. It's become quite a community asset at Shelburne Farms. So I'm almost done here. This is a photo taken in the Squim Dungeons Valley in the early 1970s. And just like you mentioned, in Squim, or the, well, around Squim, which is where virtually all the farmland in Clallam County is, 75% of the farms and farmland have been lost since the 1950s, okay? Down to uh, about 22,000 acres from uh, almost 77,000 acres. And that little blip, it's kind of, it looks like, wow, look at between 1997 and 2002, we went up from 292 farms to 455 farms, and actually farmland went up a little bit. The reason for that is USDA changes definition of a farm, and so there's a lot more people qualify. Yeah, right now, if you have the potential to sell a thousand dollars of any kind of farm product, including a horse, you don't have to sell. You have to have the potential to sell it. You're a farm, according to USDA. But anyway, I just show that because you know that county's been losing farmland at the rate of about 1,100 acres a year or the last 50 years, and, and there's very little left. And what's left has become highly fragmented. Okay. The red there, this was a part of a doctoral dissertation done in 1994, but it shows you again the landscape like you were talking about. Everything, it's not just the amount that's being, but it's scattered all over. There's development everywhere. The land's being broken up in all these little pieces and, and so forth. 
So what time of farming can coexist with that? We've gone from when I started there in 1995, there were seven dairies, there's one dairy left. In 1950, there were almost 100 dairies in the county. They were mostly small. There were seven creameries processing milk in the county. Now there's one dairy left in the whole county. Um, so anyway, lavender's become a really big deal. And only probably a total of maybe 1,000 acres in lavender in the whole county. Uh, and most of it's on, you know, most of it in farms less than 10 acres. Uh, but anyway, it's become a major thing, and it's an agritourism industry. 